Whatever you think about the creative side of WWE, there is no question that the way McMahon built and maintained the number one wrestling promotion in the world is fantastic. WWE has been continuously profitable for decades, only making losses during the grim days of the mid-1990s during the Monday Night War and that one time that he tried to run his own football division, but we'll come back to that a little bit later on. WWE is supposedly looking for a buyer. The company is being sold for around $7 billion if reports are true. Vince McMahon made that happen and nobody else and all credit to him. Outside of pro wrestling, he has attempted to launch lots of other businesses and all of them have crashed and burned. McMahon's earliest business failure was catastrophic and it's a miracle that he managed to bounce back from it at all. The year was 1974 and at the age of 28, McMahon spent every penny he had backing Evil Knievel. Knievel was the celebrity stuntman of the 1970s and it's no exaggeration to say that Knievel mania was running wild around the globe. Everyone was in awe of his death-defying motorbike jumps that aired on television. McMahon was in awe of Knievel's bravery too and saw dollar signs every time he witnessed another one of his stunts. Knievel's luck almost ran out in 1967 when he tried to jump over the Caesars Palace Fountains in Las Vegas. The crash put him in a coma for 29 days, but when he came around, he realised that his fame had skyrocketed. The accident in Las Vegas proved Knievel's mortality, making his stunts seem all the more dangerous. When Knievel got back on his feet, he announced that his next stunt would be his biggest yet. Next time, he would attempt to jump Idaho's Snake River Canyon. McMahon saw this as an opportunity to make a fortune from Knievel by promoting the jump and putting it on closed-circuit television, charging punters to watch it. McMahon gave Knievel $250,000 and it would be one of his biggest mistakes. Knievel botched the jump massively when his parachute deployed too early due to a design flaw. It was a spectacular failure for Knievel, but it was also a financial failure for McMahon when hardly anyone paid to watch the event on closed-circuit TV. The losses incurred meant that McMahon had to file for bankruptcy to the tune of $1 million shortly thereafter. Incredibly, McMahon managed to bounce back and established Titan Sports before purchasing the WWF from his dad, in 1982. Before buying the WWF, McMahon purchased the Cape Cod Coliseum in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts. The Coliseum was a 7,200-seat multi-purpose arena that played host to some of the biggest rock acts at the time, including Aerosmith and Black Sabbath, and it would also become home to the Cape Cod Buccaneers ice hockey team. McMahon really wanted to run an American Hockey League team, but those plans fell through. The Atlantic Coast Hockey League had just started up, so McMahon opted to run a team in that division instead. The league was doomed to disaster from the start, as two of the teams in the league folded less than 10 games into the season. McMahon was deeply angered by this and demanded a $15,000 loan from the Atlantic Coast Hockey League due to the fact that he was losing money on the venture. The league denied McMahon the money and the ACHL bosses decided to end the season early and start the playoffs. McMahon was furious by this point and considering his team were at 17-21-1, he took his ball, or in this case his puck, and went home to New York. He folded the business after less than one season and that would be the end of the Cape Cod Buccaneers. As the 1980s rolled on, McMahon would find success in wrestling as he took over the wrestling promotion that was run by his father and turned it into the worldwide leader in sports entertainment. McMahon's preference for larger-than-life personalities and even bigger bodies was clear to see on the WWF's television programmes each week. If only McMahon had decided to stay in his lane rather than launching the World Bodybuilding Federation. 
just like when he trampled all over the regional wrestling promotions of the 1980s to build his wrestling empire, McMahon wanted to transform the competitive bodybuilding industry in a similar way. The International Fitness and Bodybuilding Federation was founded in 1946 and continues to be the sport's governing body to this day. McMahon would quickly make an enemy out of them. First, McMahon started promoting his own bodybuilding magazine called Bodybuilding Lifestyles, which he would end up promoting at a booth for the 1990 IFBB Mr. Olympia competition. At the show, McMahon's talent director took to the stage of the IFBB's own show and announced, We at Titan Sports and Bodybuilding Lifestyles magazine are pleased to announce the formation of the World Bodybuilding Federation and we're going to kick the IFBB's ass. The owner of the IFBB were unsurprisingly disgusted at McMahon's promotional tactic on their own show. McMahon offered huge contracts to some of the IFBB's talents, including a bodybuilder named Gary Stridham, who was paid $400,000 per year and was tipped to become the WBF's version of Hulk Hogan. The first WBF event was held at the Trump Taj Mahal in June 1991. From the off, it was clear that McMahon was trying to make sports entertainment of the bodybuilding world as he increased the production values, had lots of beautiful women on the screen, and gave his so-called body stars their own personalities and costumes. In the lead-up to the first show, the WBF was heavily promoted across WWF television, which ended up annoying both the fans at home and the wrestlers at the same time. The WWF superstars were resentful of the WBF body stars due to their massive contracts, the amount of screen time they were taking up, and the fact that they didn't have to take any of the risks in the ring that they were having to take. Fans of wrestling were mostly uninterested too. They didn't want to tune into the pay-per-views of this new WBF show because bodybuilding was a niche interest, far smaller than pro wrestling, and it had very little crossover. Unlike Vince McMahon, the WWF fans just didn't care about bodybuilding. The already established fans of bodybuilding were immediately put off by the ridiculous gimmicks and costumes. Regis Philbin hosted the first television programme and Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth made an appearance on the show. Everything about the first edition of the WBF came across like it was a wrestling show without the wrestling. That vibe only increased when accusations of competition fixing quickly emerged as highest paid performer Gary Stridham won first place and the second and third highest paid stars won silver and bronze. The second of the two pay-per-views saw the WBF draw just 3,000 pay-per-view buys and McMahon decided to end the project. The XFL would be McMahon's most costly and most visible failure. The amount of bluster around the XFL was unreal. This wasn't going to be some feeder system or second-rate division. This was going to be direct competition to the NFL, or so McMahon thought. McMahon thought that the NFL was up its own ass and had lost its sense of fun and had too many rules. And so he teamed up with NBC Sports chairman Dick Ebersole to create a brand new football division, pitching it as a sports version of Survivor, where each game would be filled with suspense and built around the personalities on the field. The XFL was an equal partnership between the WWF and NBC, featuring eight teams all owned by the XFL themselves. As the hype machine kicked into high gear, Promotional material appeared everywhere. A month before launch, a promotional blimp adorning the XFL logo came crashing down in California, causing $2.5 million in damage. The accident was a premonition of things to come. Come the day of the first game in the XFL season, extra special focus was played to the cheerleaders. Even WWF-style backstage segments were aired, the game of football itself was modified, so there was no coin toss. Instead, there was a scramble for the ball at the start of the match. 
This new concept proved so dangerous that it caused serious injuries to the players. The hype around the XFL launch initially proved to be worthwhile, as the opening night scored 16 million viewers and was considered a huge success. However, that success wouldn't even last a week. Despite the hype, the quality of football itself was terrible. Clearly, McMahon hadn't learned any lessons from the World Bodybuilding Federation. Once again, he'd alienated the sport's existing fan base. Long-time football fans even registered their disgust towards NBC, forever associating with the XFL. Poor quality football plus vulgarity didn't win football fans over, even the ones disenchanted with the NFL. They wanted sport, not sports entertainment. After just one week, the audience was cut in half, and NBC were itching to get rid of the XFL. Not only that, but the players were jumping ship too. In the last 10 days of the league, five players decided to go and sign with the NFL. The XFL folded after one season, with McMahon losing $35 million on the concept. Incredibly, McMahon tried to resuscitate the XFL brand, announcing in 2018 that the XFL would return, but this time as a real alternative without the vulgarity and the gimmicks. The league was forced to shut down in April 2020 due to the pandemic and once again filed for bankruptcy. So far, we've taken a look at McMahon's failures outside the wrestling business. However, even some of his ventures emblazoned with the WWF or WWE logo have been doomed to fail. In 1999, when the WWF was at its peak in terms of popularity and profit, McMahon was determined to spend those multi-millions of dollars. The scheme this time was to operate a WWF-themed restaurant, and the place chosen for the restaurant was one of America's most astronomically priced rental locations. Not satisfied with placing his restaurant just anywhere in Midtown Manhattan, McMahon chose to place it in Times Square. In what is now the Hard Rock Cafe at 1501 Broadway, the WWF set up shop and once again failed to please anybody. Any of you fans who were around at the time or have seen any pay-per-view from the year 2000 will remember them cutting to WWF New York where events would be shown live on big screens around the venue. Sometimes there would be a superstar doing signings at WWF New York and they also hosted the Tough Enough finals there as well. And there was a gift shop. Who doesn't love a gift shop, of course? The restaurant never made any money. In fact, most of the outlets on Times Square are loss leaders due to those sky-high rents. Businesses open on Times Square more for the prestige than anything else. When the WWF changed to WWE, they decided to rebrand the restaurant entirely, becoming the world. In the end, there was nothing to distinguish the restaurant from the other dozens of service restaurants that fill that part of New York. It wasn't much different from TGI Fridays or Dave and Buster's. McMahon would close the business in 2003, having cost WWE a whopping $35.5 million. There are plenty of other failed ventures that I could pick up on in this video, such as Tout. Who remembers the social media platform that allowed users to record short videos for the world to see. Sound familiar? Well, it will sound familiar to you if you were watching WWE in 2012, because they wouldn't stop talking about it. WWE invested $5 million in Tate, and that was $5 million they would never see again. All entrepreneurs take a gamble and have their hits and misses, Unlike many entrepreneurs, however, Vince McMahon's business failures have been really visible, as most of them have been promoted on television. If Vince McMahon plans to sell WWE to a major player in the next few months, then he stands to earn $3 billion from the deal. And that's the bottom line. And in business, that's all that really matters. 